Is this thing on? Maybe. Maybe it's time to start the show. Everybody, welcome to Design Career Network's Get That UX Job. I'm Andy Galper, and I'm your host for this evening. And tonight, we will be meeting with the wonderful David Huang, a de design director from Webflow. And before I introduce David, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Design Career Network. Design Career Network is an organization dedicated to educating product designers on special special areas of user experience and um, finding new paths for their career in design and technology. So basically we produce content every Thursday. We go live every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time and then also sometimes Tuesdays, which has been happening more frequently because it's so much fun. But um, beyond that, we are always looking for um, new designers and and new people to give talks and contribute to the show. So if you're interested, email me, Andy Galpern, A-N-D-I at designcareer.org. Now, um, I'd like to bring on Mr. David Huang, who is the design director from Webflow. Prior to Webflow, David was at One Medical, and he was a design manager there as well. And, well, now he's a design director at Webflow. Then he was a design manager at Webflow. At, well, at One Medical, where he worked with a very awesome team. As, and now you just work with awesome teams all the time, don't you, David? I feel very lucky. Like, I sometimes feel, I don't know, thank, like, I feel very spoiled, right? Everywhere I've gone, uh, have had amazing teams to work with. And it makes my job so, so easy when you have awesome people around you. Well, they're lucky to have you too. So I'm sure that they appreciate having you as their leader. So, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And David is going to teach you basically how to um, what it's sorry. David is going to teach you some ideas and educate, you know, thoughts about transitioning from being an individual contributor designer to becoming a manager and deciding basically, do you even want to become a manager? You'll find that out today and stick around because we will have a, a Q and a from YouTube chat right after his presentation is over. And we thank you so much. I'm going to hide out and let David take the spotlight. All right. So hopefully you can see my screen and my deck. Um, so thank you so much again, Andy, uh, for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so yeah, just quick intro. Uh, my name's David. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And as Andy mentioned, um, I've, I've um, had a couple of different leadership roles that I've been excited about. So currently director of design, uh, been focusing on brand, product design, and user research. I also teach uh, UXD at General Assembly part-time and have really enjoyed that. It's kind of been a great way to uh, to mentor and teach uh, new UX designers as well. And I also do a little bit of angel investing on this side. So I like to work with primarily design founders to kind of help them in their journey. And yeah, previously I led product design at One Medical. And uh, before that I was director of uh, mobile design at a company called Black Pixel. It's, a, it's an agency. And we'll talk a little bit about like how those different roles uh, manifested. And, um, you know, before I go into the talk, I, I have a confession for this group. Um, I did not think I was going to go into management. In fact, I remember when I was young in my career, I was like, I'm never going to be a manager. Like managers don't do anything. They just go to meetings they talk about vision. They say the same things over and over again. And it was just one of those things where it serendipitously happened. So, uh, you know, in terms of like food for thought, uh, you know, this is the question I always ask people when they are interested in management. The first is, are you sure you want to be a manager? 
And the second is, are you really sure you want to be a manager? Because I think when we think about management, there's a lot of different motivators and other things that are factors in that. And, you know, quite frankly, some of them aren't true. So uh, I'd like to kind of kick off this conversation talking about the five management myths that I'd like to debunk in this conversation. So I would say if you come out of this talk and you're like, I don't want to be a manager. I, I want to be an individual contributor, which we often call in short, like an IC. That's fine. That's great. Right. And I think this is really about reflecting on what it means to be a manager and, and what some of the pathways are. So I would say the first myth is that people think design management is only about supporting people. And uh, that's not true. I think, you know, some of the best managers, uh, care is the most important thing, supporting your people. And, you know, it's probably a good attribute that you care deeply and want to support people that you should go into management in the first place. However, there's other roles and responsibilities about design management that, that comes with that too. So we'll talk a little bit later about what some of those responsibilities are that you have to prioritize, like supporting people in addition. So to be clear, you always want to support people, but there's more to it than the role in that. The second thing we often hear a lot too, is that you, you need to become a design manager in order to move up in your career. Unfortunately, in times past, this might, this might have felt true right? That in order for you to move up the career ladder, you had to go into the management path. And this is true across all industries, all verticals of tech, not just UX design, engineering, and product too. Uh, the reality is, is there's been a lot of work recently, uh, including at Webflow too, where we have parallel paths where like we have individual contributors who are at the same level as a manager. So, you know, a manager is a role. And it's, it doesn't mean someone's more important than, than other people because of that. So I think that's really important is like when you think about your career path and think about the things that you deserve, whether it's compensation, recognition, and responsibility, know that it's not just being a manager is the only path. You can be a principal designer. You can go into design operations. There's so many aspects that uh, you can uncover. So that's myth number two. Number three is that people often feel like design managers have to be the best designers on their team. In fact, that is quite the opposite. So for me, I am always surrounded by designers better than me. And that's the sign of, you know, what you want to do as a manager is you want to bring people in uh, better than you. So if you watch sports or if you watch like, you know, any other sort of practice, have you ever noticed that some of the best coaches and some of the best leaders weren't the best players, right? They might have been a role player and they had quite the IQ and EQ to be a really good manager. So that's myth number three is that the manager should not be the best person, in fact. Myth number four, I, I hear this a lot and I bet you uh, many of the managers you see out in the world today probably wish they could be an IC again, but there is a little bit of maybe an ego or a stigma that people might feel that becoming a design manager is the point of no return. Uh, when I joined One Medical, I joined as an IC and I decided to take a break from management until there was this opportunity to come back and go into the management track. Um, I've had people on my teams who were managers and then decided to go back to the IC path. So. Uh, you know, the path, the, the pathways have many roots. So it's not just this linear path that you can't go back to. And myth number five, I think a lot of people think because design managers do go to a lot of meetings, that's a reality of it, that you don't have to care about design anymore. You don't have to care about the quality of the work. In fact, that's the opposite. Now you're responsible for just a broader scope of these areas to care about. So I think that's a, a big myth. Like, um, you know, a design manager is always gonna be a designer. So uh, that's myth number five. So hopefully we debunk some of those myths. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions. 
uh, about any of those, but I do want to transition into talking about uh, what makes a great manager. Uh, there's a lot of attributes that um, you can consider about a great manager, but I really like to try and simplify it in, in the best way possible for me. So from my point of view, I think great design managers act like a head of design in their area, whether it's a team of two, a team of eight, maybe they have a team of 20 and they're managing managers. And the three core roles of this is being a strategist, being an operator and a coach. And I'll talk about what some of these areas mean. So being a strategist, a design strategist, the question is, are we meeting our business goals? So an area that you focus here is talking about um, understanding customer problems end to end. You're the connector of the team's work to, their, to the goals of the business. You're doing research and development to identify new opportunities and you create an inspiring design vision for your team. So first and foremost, a design manager is still a designer. Now you're designing your team. You're designing those pathways to connect to what other designers work on. The second part is being an operator. Is our team happy and effective? And this varies across multiple areas. You know, you're focusing on team health, team culture, and engagement. Do they have a sense of belonging? Do they have a sense of psychological safety? Do you have enough designers? A big part of a design manager is you are now seek, like looking for talent and focused on recruiting and hiring. And then uh, performance management too. So making sure that people are meeting expectations that you set. How do you get someone struggling onto the path of, um, of meeting expectations? How do you reward those who are exceeding expectations to get them ready for their next challenges? And you're developing processes and frameworks. So how the team runs and operates is the second most important part. And the third part, I think is the most important because it ties it all in together is being a really good coach. Are your team members growing? Are you helping them grow in their career? How do you approach situational leadership? Like what happens when you face resilient times like we are right now? What happens when you are focused on hyper growth? There's so many things where you have to adjust and adapt and make sure you're there having one-on-ones and making sure that your team members are supported. And one thing that's important to note is a manager's responsibility will change based on the, what the company needs. So the one thing that's really different about being an IC and a manager is you'll hear me talk a lot about business need. And what business need means is how is the organization growing? Is there a need for a manager? Whereas as an individual contributor, usually companies are looking for top talent and hire them. So the company you choose towards your management path is going to be really important as well. So I'll just share my career experience to talk about um, how that role has changed for me uh, over time. So I'll talk about Webflow, One Medical, and Black Pixel. And Webflow is changing all the time. You know, we're growing a lot and, and, and it's a dynamic environment, but you'll see here in this pie chart, most of my role is an operator. Uh, I, I manage managers and a lot of what I'm focused on is making sure that the management team and design leadership team have what they need to recruit, hire, you know, can they operate as the head of design in these pillar areas they're focused on. So, you know, not a lot of time doing a lot of the other stuff because, um, you know, our org is about 25 people right now. So there's a lot of operations, you know, we're doing a lot of hiring, we're doing a lot of recruiting and, you know, we need to make sure that we're supporting our team at scale. At One Medical, it was a little bit more of a balance. I was managing individual contributors directly. So I had more time to be a little bit of a strategist to, to work with the team pretty closely on the design of their work. And it was a much smaller team. It was around, you know, 10, 10 to 12 people at, at the end of my tenure there. So you can see how this change is different, you know, managing people directly versus managing groups of managers are different responsibilities as well. 
And when I was at Black Pixel, uh, it was a digital agency. So a lot of it was working with top clients. So a lot of my work was, though I was a director, I was doing quite a bit of uh, design work as well. So you can see how the shape of the business and what it needs can be very different uh, in terms of how your role shapes up. What design skills transfer over? You know, because when I think, I think there are two really hard milestones to get in uh, your UX design career. The first is getting into UX in the first place. That's the biggest challenge, right? Is like getting into your first role. The next is probably getting into your first management role. So I do want to be clear. These are, these are big milestones and big challenges, but I believe you can do it, you know, and I think it's important to talk about the skills that do transfer over. So again, I'm going to be repeating myself is that you're still a designer. You just happen to be focusing on certain areas. So the foundational design skills that have gotten you here so far is going to transfer over because now you're coaching and developing people to really build up those skills and level it up. Guess what? Empathy and active listening, iterating experimentation. This is the UX design process. And the product that you're now working on is the team. So now your customers and your audience are the designers on your team. You want to be empathetic. You want to try and understand their problems and solve for that. And you're doing it in a systematic way. So uh, it's really no different than your skills as a UX designer. And I think great managers have to be storytellers. Uh, the same way you are as a UX designer, you have to tell a great story. You have to be persuasive and you have to get people to care. And then the last part is system design. Um, I don't think there's any more complex system in the world than a group of human beings trying to work together to achieve a goal. It's hard, right? There's a lot of challenges and dynamics of people. People are different. We're all unique. Uh, so system design is going to be really important for that. So let's talk about the skills that you might not have exposure to that are really important. And we'll talk about how you can start developing that. Uh, leadership and communication, you know, a lot of that at the management level is making sure that you have great soft skills. Um, I don't like to call them soft skills because I think they're hard skills. So like being great at speaking, being great at writing, communicating clearly and uh, consistently as well. Being able to coach and develop others, because when you shift into management, your personal growth is less important than that of people on your team who are growing. Like certainly you'll develop your own growth as well, but the priority is making sure that, uh, you know, people, people are effective on your team. Um, delegation. I will tell you my first day as a design manager, actually my first week, I felt like I didn't do anything all week. I'm like, what am I doing now? Like I haven't shipped anything, haven't done any design. It's because I've delegated to everyone on my team and that's the goal. Assessing talent. How do you, how do you skill build and recognize like who could be good designers on your team? And then it's the act of influencing over being like a direct contributor because as a manager, you shouldn't touch the work yourself directly if you have a team around it. You need to motivate, inspire, and influence people to, to find their path in, in that format. And as we think about working towards management, uh, you know, these are things you can do now. I really believe, regardless of whatever you want to do in your career, like don't think about it as a five-year plan. Don't think about it as a 10-year plan. Think about what are these things that I can start doing now to build those skills. So a couple of skills and a couple of things that um, you can start doing now. Um, first, talk to your manager about your interest in the career path. Um, I will tell you, one of my managers previously in my career, it wasn't until I told her, you know, I'd be really interested in management that she unlocked and opened this opportunity. I know it sounds very obvious, but it's important to start having those conversations and see how you can start building those skills now. 
uh, you can mentor other designers too. And if you're at a place where you're the only designer, you can mentor people externally. You like, there's probably so many uh, new designers and junior designers that would love your mentorship. Um, the only thing I would advise is, advise is don't force it, right? You don't want to start trying to manage your peers in a way that feels like too forceful. Uh, I think mentorship happens organically and you'll know when it happens. So uh, identify opportunities either in, inside of work or outside of work where you can start mentoring. And that's going to be like how you show evidence that someone that you have potential as a manager, right? Is that someone's going to say, I'm growing, I'm developing, and I'm gaining a lot from these conversations with my mentor. And that is such a great skill to translate into management. Start building your portfolio of management skills. You know, we talked about some of the things that um, are important in the previous slide. Uh, I'll give you one example. So at Webflow, you know, we have some uh, ICs who are interested in the, the management path. What we decided to do is to get them really involved in the hiring process, help, help us and have them shadow uh, how we approach evaluating designers. So they get exposure to contributing to the work uh, you know, while making sure that there's good guidance from us uh, to be able to like help give feedback and input on that. But when they're starting to work towards their management readiness, they have some experience around some of these core areas that as an IC, you wouldn't get exposure to. So if you're a UX designer right now, or if you're a manager in the audience, these are some ways to really open up those opportunities for people to build those skills because they need a portfolio of skills to show that they're a good, they can be a, a good manager. And my final recommendation is I can't tell you enough how, how important writing and sharing your point of view is, whether you're a manager or not right now. So if you like to write, if you like to blog, maybe you like to make videos too, you know, like whatever the medium is, it's such a great way to share with people your philosophy and what you might be as a manager. And a lot of those are, will resonate. So the same way you write about case studies of your work, talk about your management philosophy, like be in that seat of a manager right now. Like what would it be like for someone to be managed by you? These are great exercises to start writing and thinking about. And as far as career path, um, you know, there's, there's quite a variation in uh, the manager path that you should think about too. Um, I think what people often do is they organically look at the top of the uh, career ladder, right? They're like, I want to get there. But, you know, what I encourage you to think about is what really brings you a lot of joy in the work that you do. Because the role of a manager versus the senior manager can be different too, each role has more responsibilities, you know, and then the director role, like the role I'm in, uh, it's very different than being like a direct line manager. So direct line manager being a, you know, a manager where you're uh, managing ICs directly, you have different relationships on your team. So for example, uh, you know, I only have one-on-ones with uh, the managers on my team weekly, but then with some of the ICs, I do it like once a month or every six weeks. And then if you're an exec or a VP, it might be once a quarter, right? So think about the certain level of management that you like, what those areas of those, the three buckets I mentioned, right? Strategist, operator, and coach. Like what are those three areas that, what are the three areas are most important to you? Because it's gonna vary across these different roles and these different companies. And I want to share some final thoughts before we jump into some Q&A is um, I think, you know, I was trying to write something about like, how could you define design management in one statement? And there's so many permutations of it, but I think for me, it's really about the craft of galvanizing human beings toward a shared mission while you're developing their professional and personal growth as well too. So as an action item, if you're still thinking about uh, if you want to be a manager, maybe I talked you out of it too, but if you are still thinking about it, a couple of questions you can reflect on. 
what areas of design management do I care most? And what gives me, uh, what gives me the most energy? Because I think uh, being a manager, it takes a lot of energy. So you want to make sure you get fulfillment out of it. So think about like what that area is. Some of us really love design. There are moments where, you know, I might work on something in Figma just as a side project or just something to explore. And I'm like, wow, this feels great. Uh, will you be happy if your primary focus is to ensure the best outcomes for other people and have less time to design personally? It's okay to say no. Like I want to just design all the time. There is nothing wrong with that. For me personally, I, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. Like I just feel so grateful to work with the team that I do. Another thing to ask yourself is who can I learn from right now? And it doesn't have to be someone at work. It doesn't have to be your manager. Think about those you look up to that you want to learn from and, and reach out to them. You know, I, I truly believe in the power of cold emails uh, when, when done respectfully, uh, that you that most people in the universe are going to want to to be helpful. So um, think about like make a list of who are these people I can reach out to to talk about management, to practice, to learn. And then finally, which career path in management is going to give you the most joy? Again, it's going to there are so many paths as an IC or as a manager you really want to understand the scope of what it is because in the end, like your happiness and what's important to you is going to be the most important thing to think about when you take on a design role, because you can't take care of others before you take care of yourself. And then, Oh, I'm sorry. I lied. There's a fifth one. So uh, start asking yourself, how can you start developing these skills uh, starting now? Like, what can you do after, uh, you know, after this live stream? Can you start getting exposure to hiring and recruiting? Can you start helping review portfolios for junior designers who would really love that feedback so you can start evaluating talent? Can you start, uh, you know, thinking about coaching and, and helping other people develop skills? There are so many things you can start doing now write about it and show that as your case study of your portfolio of what it'd be like for you to be a, like to be a manager. So that's all I got. Um, thank you so much for um, the time and letting me kind of share some of my thoughts and would love to continue the conversation. Uh, this is where you can follow me, but would love to answer any other questions we didn't get to. There's so many things we could talk about. Oh, wait, you can't hear me. There we go. The I can Everybody, hear you now. give it up for David Hong. Did I say your name correct that time? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It, it, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> I'm like, um, just a moment. Oh, my camera. Okay. I just need to turn my, my camera. Well, I guess I'll use this one. I just got a new camera. So and all right there you are and that one works just as well um thank you okay thank David, you that was so informative and awesome and i know we have a great crowd here we have about 37 people here waiting maybe we could start off by asking everybody what their background is um that might help us understand who we have in the audience and just wait for for the replies Camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two. <laughs> what does everybody do? do you, are you a manager? Are you an aspiring manager, senior product designer? Senior product designer. Yeah. And I guess while that happens, we can go jump into some questions while my, doesn't matter as much of my camera, um, although I have the right one set up now, but it doesn't matter. There we go. Ah, uh, yes. There we go. Cam camera two. Um, graphic designer, pharmacist, transitioning into UX, manager, UX, UI, product designer. Oh, I see a, I see a great question, Andy. Can I, can I read it? Yeah. 
Absolutely. So there's a question. Um, what if there's no space to grow as a manager, i.e. interns are overseen by someone else? There is no open uh, manager slot. I've been mentoring outside of doing hiring, but I don't see a way forward. Um, this is such a great question. And it's a hard question you're going to ask is, should you stay there? Because like I said, there needs to be a business case and there needs to be, you know, you need to kind of have that as part of management readiness too. And truthfully, it can be hard when you're an IC at your company and you want to be seen as a manager. So as much as I want to say like, no, there's going to be a clear path. I think it's really important to ask yourself, like, am I going to find this opportunity here? Or do I have to go somewhere else to really get that experience? Um, so thank you for asking that. I think that's a really important question. And I think for us, that's why it's so important. We want to, even if we don't promote people in the management right now in Webflow, we want to make sure they have that exposure and feel like they're gaining and growing from that. Because, you know, when, when that business need does come uh, and, you know, for us, like we're, we're growing a lot. So we're just kind of anticipating it. Uh, that's important to have, but it's not true for all, all companies, right? So like, you know, ask yourself, do you have to go somewhere else to get that opportunity? And, you know, that's okay. You're not going to stay at a place forever. I don't know if that's a, yeah, I don't know if that's like a optimistic answer, but I, I think it's a reality though. So, you know, I would, I would consider that. Oh, Andy, I think I can't hear you. Um, Sorry about oh, that. You I, wanted, there you go. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. So, uh, But I was saying that something that you mentioned when we were chatting was that um, regardless, if you're going to stay with the company or not, a great manager will train you or listen, listen to your needs and help guide you and let you make that, you know, the best decision for yourself. Um, instead of just not, you know, only thinking about their own needs right now. Is that correct? That's correct. I think for me, like someone once asked me, like, how do I define success um, as a, as a people manager or people leader? And it was probably my interview at Webflow, but I think like, uh, you know, one thing that is important is that you're invested in people's careers, not just at the current role too. So there have been times with people I've been, I've had the pleasure of managing where that opportunity didn't come up. And we had that conversation that I'm like, you know, you might have to look elsewhere. And it's important to have that like open and transparent relationship with your manager, right? Because like, I know, and this is where trust and psychological safety is important is you need to be able to have that man like conversation because it's very like, hopefully, you know, it's hard to have those conversations at times and it's put, making you very vulnerable. But I think for me, I've always set that precedent with people on my team. That's like, look, we are not going to be here forever. Uh, you or me, you know, so like, let's, let's talk about your career growth. And if you're feeling like there isn't that pathway of what you deserve or what you, what you want right now, let's figure it out, you know, and it's not, it's not personal. It's just sometimes the business is not ready for, for that need, or maybe there's other things that, you know, we want to see and, and we're not aligned and, um, and that has happened before, but I think it's just kind of making sure that you're invested in people for, for their entire career. That's awesome. It's such a, a wonderful way to think about it. Lovely. No. <laughs> so Gabe will, um, myth number two, if, even if management isn't necessary to move up, do you think senior managers, directors, et cetera, have more influence than an independent contributor? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I think I, I would frame it as two things. So thanks for this question, Gabe. I think, I think there's two eyes, right? Influence and impact. So, I think influence is a little bit different on, on a manager's side where like, you know, I would be lying if I said like, you know, as an IC, this is what product managers have challenges with, right? Like how do you influence and make impact without being someone's direct manager, right? Cause product manager doesn't manage 
the engineers and the designers they work with. Um, being a high influence IC is really important too. And I think the thing that's important is that like, you know, when you work for a company and the impact that you deliver for the business and the customers, it's not going to be management that's going to deliver that, right? It's going to be like the contributions of individual contributors. So I think a lot of that is high impact. I think really good senior managers will bring like high performing and high, highly influential ICs into those conversations. So, you know, I've always relied on really senior ICs to be like, you know, we want you to lead this initiative. So I think that's a way to, to have, to have influence. But I think, you know, there, there is kind of that direct management line, but I think, um, you know, it, there are, there are ways to, to, to show that influence and impact as well. Nice. And okay. So Andy Ork, and by the way, Andy and I worked together at the student newspaper at Florida Atlantic University in South oh, Florida. And now he's, world. In, he's in New York. He's a really awesome designer. So, um, but it's really great to see you, Andy, the other Andy. But um, anyway, he, Andy was wondering uh, what did you do for before you became a design manager and what was the turning point for you? Oh yeah, that that's such a great question. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, other Andy. Uh, I think I realized I didn't really touch on it. It wasn't like I was born into management and just kind of started doing that. So I was an IC. You know, a lot of my design background was more around like research and prototyping. So you know, I started pretty early in my career. Probably going to date myself here, but I kind of started doing design when uh, you know just right when I was at, out of college, like that's when, um, you know, iOS came out. So really kind of got into working in that platform and did a lot of design and code and, and then ended up doing like a lot of prototyping work. Um, what was the turning point? Um, I think it was a thing where, um, you know, I, I would say this It's kind of general, but I would say, I truly believe this. I say, the best managers are people who may not have an intention of becoming a manager. Like they're just there trying to help, trying to mentor and help grow people. And then all of a sudden you're like, this person has a lot of potential to lead. And I think I really benefited from people who believed in me to be able to kind of take a chance on that. So it wasn't like, uh, and I mentioned this early in, in my talk, Andy, I was just like, I, I had no intention of going into management. I was like, I want to be the best designer and just like, do all the cool things and, and work on that stuff. And I think that was the turning point where, you know, I really felt this great connection with my peers and the people I worked with where I, you know, I wanted to invest in, in them. And then I think with leadership, you know, at, at various companies like saw that and then uh, put me into a position in management. So I didn't touch on this in the talk, but I think like there's usually, um, there's usually three ways to get into management, right? So one is your manager leaves or it gets fired or, you know, something happens and there's a need for someone to manage in the interim. The other is, you know, you might be building a team from scratch or you might be like the first designer at a startup and you're growing that way. And then the other is, uh, you know, continued progression and career development. I think larger companies have a great support system for that. So I think that's where it usually happens, but yeah, the turning point for me was just kind of knowing that, like, I just found a lot of joy in sharing what I know and helping grow grow other people. I love it. A natural um, care, caring person. What is the word for? It starts with an A. Alt altruistic, right? Ooh, that's some fancy of, yeah. word. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what? But that's an. It, it, I'm wondering if you kind of answered that or maybe you have a tip to add on to that. Uh, Michelle Mulia asks, mm -hmm. how do you get hired as a design manager in a new role when you've never done that before? The exact same way you do when you got in the UX design, right? And it again, it's I'm not going to say it's easy, right? Because I think you have to show that evidence. You have to really kind of start doing the work. And I think that's why I really like emphasize 
like start showing your skills, right? Like treat it as a portfolio. Like these are, you know, these are people I've mentored and like, you know, tell those stories, not like have a portfolio of like, like actual people, you know, in that regard. But I think it's, it is important to show that, you know, you can do that because I, I would say in any management role that people are hiring for, they're trying to de-risk, right? So the more you can de-risk, uh, you can show that, uh, you know, even though you've been in IC, maybe you've informally, you know, managed someone, maybe you've like worked with an intern, like really talk about those stories and have them be your advocates for that, you know? So as you apply for roles, they're going to be your references, right? So uh, again, I'd say, yeah, the exact same way. At one point we were all not in UX and then got in there somehow. And that's the same way with management, right? Is to continue to kind of push for that. And uh, yeah, but it is very challenging. It's the, the two hardest milestones in your design career. But what about after, like after you get, okay, so after you become a UX manager, then you become a director. You said you might have to switch companies to grow into that mm -hmm. possibly. And then the same thing over and over again. Then you're like, okay, now I'm going to become a senior director. Now I'm going to own the company. I'm taking yeah, it. Over. Yeah. Yeah. No. Be a VP, right? Yeah. VP. Okay. Um, this is actually a wonderful question from Hannah. Um, so Hannah Soskina, hope I said your name correctly. Hi, David. Any questions or suggestions? Sorry. Any suggestions on how to run a one-on-one -on -one as a manager? What does a good one-on-one -on -one look like? And how does it happen? How do you make it effective? What an awesome question. Yeah, really great question, Hannah. So um, I, I have a resource you should look up. So um, I, I was very fortunate to have two awesome managers at one medical. One was uh, Kimber Lockhart, our CTO. Uh, she has a great article about one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So I bet if you put her name in the search and how to run one-on-ones, there's going to be some amazing things. Um, I'm probably going to say a lot of the stuff that, that she has shared in that. But for me, uh, I do want to answer this question live. I think it's really important as a manager is that you take, you don't, you don't cancel one-on-ones, right? You, you don't show up late. You don't want to be flustered and feel like, you know, you're rushed. You, you want to make sure that this time is sacred and important. Now there's probably times where, you might need to move it and that's fine. But I think when you get into that one-on-one, -on -one, you want the only person to matter in what you're dealing with is your direct report and your team member. And uh, I like to open it up. Um, you know, maybe sometimes I have topics I want to cover and I, I try to mention it to them right away. So it doesn't induce any anxiety, but you do want to start with kind of their agenda because one-on-ones are their time. But you might say something like, you know, I want to make sure like we have time for you. Uh, there is one thing I'd like to kind of touch on, which is kind of, you know, maybe it's like something around Q3 planning or, or, or something like that, just because I don't like to hold things and make people wonder like, oh, my goodness, what is what is he going to bring up? Uh, but, yeah, I think um, tailoring it around their agenda, like I try not to talk about project status updates unless they want to but really kind of focus on that. And then I think um, try to block like a monthly one-on-one -on -one that's focused around career development. So um, maybe it's an hour long, right? Or 45 minutes to talk about like, hey, how are you doing with your goals now? So it doesn't get lost in like those. So I, I do really believe in those like monthly development one-on-ones. And I'm going to follow up with that and ask you, um, so how about for a contractor, say that a person has like a long-term contract at a company, how would you um, work out one-on-ones and invest in career development for that person? Yeah, it's, um, it's a really good question because I think contractors, it's obviously a different relationship, right? Because it's a non-employee. So I think you want to make sure like that you're kind of following protocol with that. So I don't know, like, I don't know if this is an agency where you have a bunch of contractors and, you know, you're running it yourself, but let's say if you're at like a bigger company and you hire a contractor, right. There's, there's certain like legal aspects that you need to adhere to. 
uh, in that regard. But I think, you know, you could keep them informal. You can like have conversations about, you know, where they want to go in their career if they want to join the company full time. But I do think like it's a little bit different. So let's say like I had a, I had a consultancy for five years with one of my best friends and we hired a lot of subcontractors, but we were all like an LLC and everyone was a contractor. So I don't know if it's something where it's like talking about, you're in a full-time role and you're working with a contractor that's hired at the company or, or if it's like the other scenario. Well, more like if you're working for a third, like you're working for a company full-time, but you have a, you're on contract. So you're working for a large organization full time, mm. but you're contracting through like basically billing through gotcha. a third party agents. Yeah. 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 So is, yeah. is it same answer? I think same answer. I think it's just like, you know, you, you might want to know, like kind of learn a little bit more about how the company is structured, but I think, you know, like you have a lot of those informal conversations too. So there may be some specific logistics that, that you need to think about. Yeah. And let's, well, what are, okay. So I do have a question that, well, it might be helpful for interviewing um, let me see if I can hide this. Okay. It's relating to interviewing. So what is the most common question that is asked to a, a, a spy, an aspiring UX manager during an interview? Mm. Or maybe a set of questions, some things that, that they ask. Yeah. You. So I think one common question is they're going to ask you a situational question, you know, whether you have experience or not in it, like, um, how you've helped someone develop in their career or help someone like it, it's going to be a performance management question, right? Like how did you get someone who is struggling with some of their work back on track or how did you kind of help uh, grow people, you know, in that way? I think a lot of it's going to talk about like, you know, when you do the portfolio presentation, like uh, red flag, if you're interviewing for a manager role and they want to see like your IC portfolio work, you know, they're going to want to, see like the work that you influenced and like helped like other people achieve those outcomes. Right. So again, if you don't have management experience, maybe it's talking about like the squad you worked with and, you know, make sure you're giving credit to the people who are doing that work, but how did you influence and, and help, you know, help, help the team members achieve those outcomes. And do you still um, add like metrics and, and, all the info well anything else that that you need to include uh, in the portfolio beyond that do you want to show your product design work as well or does it just depend on the on the job i think for me i always say show enough to kind of get people again you know i think a lot of these hiring panels they're always trying to de-risk right so like try to answer as much as like what they might ask so even if it's like hey here's a quick overview of some product design stuff. And here's the philosophy that I've developed in leading teams in that way. Like, I think that, that helps de-risk, right? Like you don't want to, I always say like, try to answer all the questions before they get a chance to ask it. That's great. Yeah. Answer as many questions up front. I love that. So you were saying that about performance relating to the performance What was rewind and said, so Oh, the performance management part. Performance I think performance management. Yeah. And is there? Do you have any references for to improve on performance management? Yeah, as far as like as far as in the interview. Uh, rec sorry, recommendations or references as far as like um, books or anything that you can study upon to improve or understand the field a little better. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think. Um, you can come back to us too. I can yeah. include it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Let's let me know if I'm putting, putting yeah. you on the spot. Sorry. I'm just like, oh, let me let me ask David while I have you here. No, jump the line. Sorry, everybody. All right. Um, no, I'm not sorry at all. Here you go. <laughs> okay. Um, this is actually really interesting. Why is it that many companies, big and small, don't provide much learning and development opportunities for new managers transitioning into management for the first time? Yeah. Uh, I think this is a, you know, the honest truth is it's very unfortunate. I'm glad Nick asked this question is that I think again, uh, because people try to de-risk 
in hiring roles, we often have this revolving door of the same managers just kind of switching between different companies. And that's really sad, right? And I think because like people often look at the number of years of experience that you have as kind of like a way to de-risk, right? But you know what? Like someone could be a bad manager for like the last six years, right? And they're uh, kind of, you know, and I, I talk about like the dilution of the the leadership pipeline a lot where it's like, you know, we need to make sure we give like new talent opportunities to do that. So, um, you know, that's, that's my perspective on it. So I think all companies or not all companies, but a lot of them try to de-risk a lot. And unfortunately they over-index on previous experience where you have someone with a lot of potential and you're, you're, de- you're trying to de-risk, but you're actually like impeding on someone's growth who could be a great manager. And I think that's sad because like, you have a lot of people like, you know, people who are already at the company have so much value to bring. So, uh, you know, big or small L and I, I don't think it's a budget thing. Right. I think it's something where like, you know, people are trying to de-risk and unfortunately that's the case. And I think, again, that's why if you're in a management position, it's really important to like speak out against this and kind of really like advocate that, you know, we do need to take chances on um, or invest in like people who've never managed before. Otherwise it's like, you know, it's not scalable for the future of like design and design leadership because a lot of these leaders are going to end up retiring at some point too. Um, I know it sounds wild to think about it that long-term, but it's true, right? So we kind of need to kind of prep like the next generation of design leaders. And part of it is, is leaning out and giving other people opportunities. I love that. Absolutely. A lot of an awareness too, right? Like making sure that the company is aware that they're, they might not even realize that they're not giving that opportunity yeah. or, ch- or that there's a way to train them or skills that they need to train them. Maybe mm. they need, maybe it's a new business. All right. BFAM. Could a UX designer learn from me? What can a UX designer learn from a UX manager? I don't want to be a manager in the future. Mm, this is great. Uh, a great question. Um, this isn't. So I would say one thing, and I would say I want to preface that there's many ICs who are really good at this, but there are also many ICs who are not good at this. So I want to talk about it is I think like, uh, maybe problem framing or managing up, right, in that regard. So you can learn a lot from how managers persuade, like, other managers and, and upward leadership on why something's important, right? And I think really kind of tying into customer needs and business goals, like, you can see how, how to approach that. So I would say that's one, that, that's one thing that you can learn uh, from a manager, I think evaluating talent too. And again, like I want to preface that there, there are a lot of ICs that um, that are really good at this, but I think that's that's one thing that management gets a lot of like exposure to is like how do you how do you frame your narrative, how do you manage up, and how do you how do you influence in that regard? And for an IC to be able to do that well, it's like really like a high impact. Learned about the power of influence. This is interesting. Um, Yosu, I don't know if I, I'm saying your name right, but I'll say Martinez because I know if I, I know say that right. Yeah. Um, any advice on building a product team from scratch? That's actually, I don't know, is is that relevant? I guess it is. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah huge. Yeah. 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 So I mean, like, first off, congrats on the the new roles, director of design. Uh, I think it's. Um, it's important. So I think, so there's two things I would say. So at Webflow, um, I joined when there was already an established design team at One Medical. I was pretty early and uh, ended up hiring like almost the entire team. Uh, I mean, they've certainly hired more since I left, but uh, like basically spent my first two years there just focusing on recruiting and hiring. Uh, the advice I would give with building product design teams from scratch is there's two things. So one, I think hire for, you want familiar and different perspectives as well too. So I think for me, you know, um, as I was thinking about like building out my team, I always want to know like 
you know, who's someone that can come in and help help me scale and 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 pretty like minded in my philosophy, and who's different because you want to get these different ranges of perspectives to to kind of hold your blind spots accountable. So that's one. I think the other thing too is, um, you know, I think it's never too soon to start thinking about headroom for the growth of your team. So really think about, you know, I don't know how much headcount you have, but if you're like, okay, I have like six hires that I can make this year. Like, you know, where, where do you think the team's going in the next few years and how do you start thinking about that headroom? So I think, Again, kind of ma making sure you have like a wide range of perspectives, uh, but also having like a foundation of familiarity as you're kind of building out and, you know, kind of like implementing, I don't know, implementing is not the right word, but kind of like establishing your uh, the team and how you'd like it to run. But then also bring people who's going to give you, who are going to give you really different perspectives. And what about organizational design? Like, what do you need in terms of like, pro like, um, yeah, you need, uh, just it, well, I mean, I guess for uh, it will depend on the budget. That's okay. yeah. I, I do want to say one thing though. I think um, don't over design the org either, right? I think I really I I've been calling this philosophy just kind of like think about like org design is like elastic, right? Like, what are areas that can stretch? And what are areas that then you need to kind of firm up and, and put in place? Because I think the reason I say if you over-design orgs, let's say the team continues to grow, uh, you might have to do some unwinding of that org. So it's important to uh, really know, like, what do I need in my org? What's my plan to kind of fill that need now? And when do I need to you know, make a decision on that. And that, you know, if you're in a fast growth company that could change like every other week, you know? So like, it's important to uh, not over design org. You want to kind of shape it up and, you know, how do you, how do you keep the orgs elastic so they can stretch, but not break, but then also, you know, be flexible based on the needs of, you know, what, what you might need. Cause that could change. Congrats on the role also. I'll say that. <laughs> yes. You minted product director of product design. Nice. Nice. I love how we can see these on the screen. Okay. Nandita. I've heard about starting off in a player coach model before mm. transitioning into full fledged management. What are your thoughts on this? I have a lot of thoughts on this. So I think, uh, um, make sure that there's value to you. Right. I think there's a lot of companies that try to exploit the player coach where it's like, oh, you're an IC, but we want you to manage the team, too. And you're, you're literally doing two jobs. However, on the flip side, there are roles, you know, like let's say at smaller startups where there is a player coach. Right. Maybe maybe it's a design team of three and you don't really need a full on design manager, but they also need some some leadership. You might be able to balance that, but I think it's kind of making sure like where your time's allocated and also how you're compensated too. Because I think, uh, you know, anytime I see player coach, I really want to be like, okay, what do they mean by this? Because sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's an excuse to get people to do both roles. But I think there are some roles where it, it can be written thoughtfully where it's like, hey, you know, this is truly divided half and half or, you know, a certain percentage based on based on the need that the company has and it's it's truly authentic too so um i think that'd be my advice is just like if you see player coach or if you see those conversations really understand what the expectation is and uh you know and if you get value from it so let's say for example that this is a stretch opportunity for you to uh to manage some people but you gain from it then consider it you know but i think really, really get to know like what they mean by, by that role. Yeah. Especially when you're working in a company and you do like a million, a million yeah. roles at the same time. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. I think that, okay. Now, how does a design manager wait? Well, that I meant to press, press Peter's um, question, but I guess we're going with we can cover Buns. this one too. Mr. Yeah. Buns or Mrs. Buns or that whatever. 
sorry, I don't mean to genderize, but anyway, how does a design manager build and implement L and D for their team forward slash org? How do you decide what's right for the team given at the side and stage? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think, uh, you know, it, it, it depends on like the company you're at, right? Like some, you may not have an L and D budget and like, what do you do? Right. So I think there's some creative ways to kind of build like learning and development opportunities. If, if that's the case, you know, you can really like extend in your network or reach out to other people to kind of, you know, ask if they could come in and do a workshop and share uh, some things with teams. You know, I think so there are a lot of people who, who, who could be generous with that. Um, I think, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to tell based on, like, it's really going to depend on the budget of the organization. So, you know, um, I'd say at later stage, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, whether you're the, the owner of the, the budget or you're working with like a director or a VP, make sure L and D is a part of that. You can advocate for it. And I think, um, the best way to advocate for it is have a plan, right? And just even like a quick one pager of like what that L and D plan is, where you want people to grow. Because if you don't come with a plan and ask for a budget, people are going to be like, why, you know, like, why, like, what are we going to gain from this? But if you can come with like, Hey, our team feels like we're lacking on visual design. We think an L and D budget to kind of bring someone in to really uh, help level up our team can re really be beneficial. See, that's like, oh, like I, I want to fund that. So I think really coming up with your L and D plan and, and a pretty solid proposal can, can help if you have the budget. That's great. I love the idea of making a case for making, make a case. Okay. Now, <laughs> thanks, David. This is why I was asking if John was your friend, but then he, uh, John mentioned that you enjoyed your last subside. They enjoyed. Oh, the last <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. Well, I think John, you obviously read my newsletter, so I appreciate your 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 readership. So, um, yeah, definitely learned to click a lot of pixels from playing Diablo. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So now Peter, Peter, um, Peter asks, can you talk a little bit more about the soft skills, which we have actually have an event uh, coming up about that with Natasha from EA and that will be in May and that just rhymed. Oh, yay. Anyway, <laughs> can you talk more about the soft skills? It's more than managing people, how to manage working other stakeholders like products, product developers, executives, et cetera. Yeah. Um, no, this is a great point. I think, yeah, soft skills. I think about like, like writing, writing is, again, I see soft skills as hard skills, but I think, you know, as you think about writing communication and how you frame certain things. So like I, uh, you know, when anyone asks about soft skills, I think like, you know, think about those things that like, that kind of relate to EQ, right? It's like, how do you ask how do you coach by asking questions, you know, in a non-directive way? How do you like tell better stories that can persuade? Like, how do you think about executive presence and like some of your speech and speaking skills as well too? So, uh, you know, and I think a lot of it, honestly, it just comes with trial and error. You know, when I first became a manager, I felt so intimidated by, you know, other stakeholders. And I'm sure I like said some things that I'm like, that didn't sound great. And you learn from it, right? And I think part of it is, you know, one one actionable recommendation I have is maybe maybe there's someone in meetings with you that you trust, and ask them to observe how how your presence is and and how you operate in in those meetings and have them give you feedback. Right? It doesn't have to be your manager; it could be just a friend who's like, "Hey, could you look out for this? How can I improve?" Great. Okay, I think we have this is the last question of the day. And by the way, if and I'm I'm still on this A thing, um, <laughs> the A rhyming. Oh, if anybody has, if anybody in the audience has any suggestions for speakers or wants to learn about a specific topic relating to your design career, like possibly an industry that you're looking to break into, or you want to learn more about um, 
you know, the, the types of skills you need for that specific industry or maybe just anything at all, email me, um, Andy at designcareer.org and feel free to send me suggestions. And I think that we, okay, hold on. We, we got one more from Buns. <laughs> I can't. Oh, it's a good question. It. It's a I great question. Buns. Yeah. That's, nice buns. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I just like the name. Anyway, go ahead. What are major differences in managing a remote team versus co located team? Also, um, differences in working with ex functional stakeholders. And maybe you can elaborate more on what. Um, what is X functional? Cross functional. Yeah. Cross -functional. Okay. So right. yeah, with product, with engineering. Um, oh man, remember the days of co-located teams? Uh, yeah, it's it's a big difference, you know. And I think, um, look, I've worked at companies. Black Pixel was remote. Webflow was remote. One Medical was more co-located um, for a couple of different reasons. Like a lot of it is because there's a lot of operational components with physical offices. So, you know, there was a lot to gain from that. And I, I like both, you know, I'm not going to try and convince people like you should do one or the other, but I would say um, with, with remote work, you have to kind of design serendipity into your work schedule. Right. So when you're co-located, it could literally be you're grabbing coffee and like talking to someone about an idea and then all of a sudden you go kind of riff on it and jam on it. Like you cannot do those things remotely, like in the same way. Right. So you kind of have to design that serendipity a bit. I think the big difference in remote work is, uh, you know, asynchronous communication. Like how do you uh, kind of document things well and make sure that people like can do work, uh, you know, in, in that remote setting without it being like 10 hours of Zoom meetings, uh, especially when location varies too. So at Webflow, you know, we have designers in California and then we also have all the way to, to Russia, right? So we have designer in Moscow and it's like, we, we need to make it work, right? Because, um, you know, we need to document things and we're continuing to work on that. It's like, how do you continue that flow of work uh, in a way where, like a meeting isn't required. Uh, it, it's hard, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's important. So I think those are the, I think those are the major differences is that like a lot of it then is where, you know, documentation becomes even more important in that regard. And what tools do you recommend for um, recording yourself or taking screenshots or possibly? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. we, we are huge fans of Loom with the L. So Loom is great. Uh, they're so good at like, you know, we do a lot of presentations over Loom. So then like, you know, we'll put it in like a Dropbox paper doc. So accompanied with your documentation is some commentary and it's, it's wonderful, like highly, uh, highly recommend it. Yeah. And you can also do like the walkthroughs and write um, yeah. like video walkthroughs and explain your work through that. Or mm -hmm. I love that asynchronous communication. Anyway, so everybody give it up for David Hong from from Webflow and Substack. Actually, wait, but what you're not from Substack, but you have, no, no, I awesome have a Substack. Substack. Awesome. And OK, that's what I was going to say. Let's try that again. Everybody give it up for David Hong. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. I, I, have gonna, a, what, I was going to say, I have a sub stack because clearly John reads it. So Yes, <laughs> I was going to. So that's what I wanted to mention was I wanted to mention that you have a sub stack and that we should include in the show notes. So that way people can subscribe to your sub stack and stay up to date with your ideas, your thoughts, and possibly um, learn more, follow you along your career journey. Thank you, David. I've, I've, Thanks, everybody. Also, thank you all for attending tonight. We really appreciate it. And we will be back on Tuesday with Julia Debari talking. Actually, this is this is an event that you as aspiring design managers might recommend to somebody that you mentor. And it's about breaking into user experience. Now, Design Career Network, we cover all levels from, but, but most of it is for experience, we'll, we'll say. We cover all levels of, of um, design education, 
but most of it is for people who actually have a background in UX. So you need at least that. Um, however, on Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, we'll have Julia Debari. It's about breaking into user experience. And Julia is a design educator, and she's really fantastic. She's put together tons of courses about user experience and knows it inside and out. So please recommend it. Also, go ahead and smash that subscribe button if you like this video and like what we're doing. We love you very much, and, and make sure to like this video. Thank you already shared with the folks who I wanted to transition. Oh yeah, yeah. And Ani Ruda will be will be here. Um he he's a UX manager at LinkedIn talking about your UX portfolio in I believe it's on April 8th. Is that right? Maybe. April. It's in Okay, so the, by the way, it's at designcareer.org. designcareer.org. That's where all this information is. You can look at our upcoming schedule and stay up to date with us and also subscribe to our newsletter. So that's it. Thank you so much, David. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed working with you and hope we could do this again. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank and you. thank you everyone. Appreciate your thank time. Yeah. You. All right.